At Collins Morgan, we offer friendly, regulated and ethical advice for anyone living in Scotland. Over the last six years, we have helped thousands of Scottish residents become debt-free. Our organisation always have your best interests at heart and our advisors are trained to help you in any situation with a range of solutions always available. If you're struggling with debts, act now and call one of our friendly advisors on 0141 218 4450. We're on. Today's guest, we've got Sandra Lean. Sandra, you're a criminologist and you're here today. You've worked on the Luke Mitchell case for the last 16 years, fighting for his freedom. Yeah. How are you, Sandra? Yeah, I'm well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for giving us the time to come into your house and um, tell the story. And I got I got taught about this case. It was actually last week with Joe, a man called Joe Steele who mm. spent 18 years in prison himself for a crime he didn't commit. Was six murders occurred where six members of the Doyle family were murdered in a fire. So it was Joe actually mentioned Luke Mitchell. And if I'm honest, I know Luke as newspapers, as monster, evil, stuff like that, what I've portrayed. I don't know anything about the case. I actually dipped into it a wee bit and for the last week and you, you sent me some stuff yourself and there is a question mark, from my opinion, on the case. And it was just to see if you could shed some light on where it all began for you and, and why you get involved so much, so deeply involved in it. Yeah. Um, if we can go right back to the start, we'll start off with, what's your relationship with the Mitchell family? At the time, I didn't know them. I didn't know Jodie's family, the victim's family. I had no connection with them whatsoever. Um, the reason I got involved in any way, um, Jodie was found behind the high school that my eldest daughter attended. My girls, I have two girls who were around about Jodie's age. Um, and she was found behind that high school. Um, so we lived locally, obviously. The gossip from pretty much the first day was incredible. And I started to think, well, hang on. And, you know, they've gone after this lad immediately. What if it wasn't him? Mm -hmm. what, what if it's actually somebody else? Are my girls safe? And that was, that was what started the whole thing mm -hmm. was was their safety because it is it's a very touchy subject even me shining light on it because of the brutality of the crime yes it's 16 years Luke has always protested his innocence I know a few people in Shorts prison he doesn't dub his door he's not in protection but what got it for me and why I wanted someone to come on and speak about it is he actually passed a lie detector in prison yes to say that he wasn't a murderer and his mum actually passed a lie detector also to say that Luke was actually in her house the yeah. night of the crime. Yeah, so, and that she didn't dispose of any clothing mm -hmm. or cover up anything. Obviously, lie detector tests, they can't, you can't use them in court. No. But for two people to pass, that's millions, the odds are they're very high, millions to one, I don't know, three million, four, I don't know what it is. But I think it's important as well to realise that neither of them knew in advance what the questions were going to be. Mm -hmm. They didn't know until the day the guy turned up to do the test and... They were done, I think it was two months apart. So there wasn't even a, an opportunity for, for them to discuss potential mm -hmm. answers because they'd no idea what was going to be asked. Because people can pass tests, we get that. and But for two people to pass, and the, the odds are slim. So for me, that's when I started looking at it more. Okay. I started speaking to yourself. And as is, to dig something up like this is because it's not just affecting yourself or um, Luke's mum or Luke, you've still got to think about uh, Joe de Jones's family who think they've got a conviction yes. or but if I think personally that there's something not right then I'm going to shed light on it I'm not going to have someone potentially who may be innocent to be rotting in, rotten in basically a, a cell yeah. just um, protesting his freedom and the reason being is because Joe Steele was prime example 18 years yeah. people thought he was a beast or a murderer and the guy fought for his innocence so we'll go right back to the start. We've spoke about yeah, your relationship with the Mitchell family, but obviously when you started getting deeper into the case, when you first started on it, what was the kind of telltale signs that things weren't quite right? Initially, um, 
the, the level of gossip in this area. Um, some of the stories that, that were coming out about, supposedly about Luke's family and you know, various bits and pieces, it, it started to become apparent. There were two things that started to become apparent. The first was that some of this information had to be coming from the police. Um, you know, information about the the layout of the family home. Unless unless it was people who'd been in the family home, where else was that information coming from? Um, and the other was that people were just running with this. The hysteria was incredible. Now you got to understand, you know, this is this is a series of small areas, small communities, um, interlinked communities. Nothing like that happens here. You hear everybody says that, oh, things like that never happened here. But really, the, the shock and the the disbelief that it could have happened, especially where it happened, it's a little country path, you know, kids play down there, dog walkers, fishermen, and the whole place was just hysterical. But within that hysteria, um, it, it became apparent to me within a couple of weeks that this 14-year-old lad was in the frame. And it seemed like they were just tightening the grip. And that worried me. That really worried me. I thought, they either they caught him red-handed. You know, they've got this all this evidence and they've caught him red-handed. Or there's something a bit strange going on here. How could they possibly know this early that it was definitely him? Mm-hmm. And that was that was what started to to make me wonder about it. And then, like everybody in the area, I was talking to my friends about it and um, Luke's mum heard my take on it. I, I don't know how many people were actually questioning whether they'd gone after the right guy back then because it was blanket belief mm-hmm. the boyfriend did it. So she put a note through the door of the place of art asking if I'd be willing to meet them. And Well, the, the press certainly didn't help because... Front page, Monster, Evo, 666, the music kind of side of things, um, Nirvana, um, Slipknot, all the kind of music that people, just because it's music, obviously identify yeah. to being either crazy or they drink blood or crazy, yeah. you know, crazy shit. And f- that's what I remember. That's what I remember. I think one of the interesting things about that is the, the Marilyn Manson connection Marlon Manson, and the yeah. Black Dahlia mm-hmm. and all of that. So so Luke was, <clears throat> pardon me, obsessed with Manson and he's obsessed with the Black Dahlia paintings and he carried out a copycat murder. Until you look at the evidence, he had one Marilyn Manson uh, CD that was bought after Jodie was murdered because it had Jodie's favourite Manson track on it. That's why I bought it. It came with a bonus DVD, which again was used against him. And there was a, a calendar that somebody had given him that was in the bin. That that was his connection to Manson. Mm-hmm. There was nothing, no evidence ever, that he knew anything about the Black Dahlia pictures, that he'd ever seen them, that he'd ever been able to access them. So this whole story about how, you know, he, he, was, he was obsessed with Manson and the Black Daily and everything, there's not a single bit of evidence to support it. What about people reading black and white sticks, mud sticks? If yes. you read that, eventually you're going to read that enough, you're going to believe it. That's and that's where, that's where we need a more accountable media. Because if people are going to write this rubbish and put it out there knowing that people are going to believe it, I think it's, it's worth remembering that one day... This could be a member of their family mm-hmm. that this stuff's getting written about and that people are believing. You know, it's, it's been a bugbear in mind, obviously, for all these course, years. How long How long was Luke seeing Jodie for? How long was the relationship going on for? Um, I think they were just about three months. Still early? Sorry? Still early then? Still a fresh yes. relationship? Were yes. they friends before or did they meet at school? They met at school, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, they knew of each other prior to that and then they were introduced through a mutual friend mm-hmm. and um, by all accounts just really, really enjoyed each other's company, enjoyed being together. How was Luke's upbringing? How was his upbringing as a kid? Um, he's pretty normal upbringing. His mum and dad split up when he was 10, but on amicable terms. Um, 
he lived in the sort of leafy suburban area, the slightly posher area mm -hmm. around here. Um, went to the local high school, no issues in his childhood. There was a, a school report that he'd um, he'd been pulled up for throwing a missile at another student, and his mum was called into the school. It, it was a half Mars bar. But again, this was used after mm -hmm. the event. That's about, I think, the only thing in his... In his it's um, not suspended, no, no. dodgy behaviour. No. Crazy stuff. No, he was doing well in all his classes. He was in the, the top mm -hmm. portion of all his classes. So the evidence against Luke, we had um, a witness that said they seen Luke and Jodie on the path at that time where she got murdered. Right. Um, this was supposedly an independent witness who was driving around a very sharp bend on the road and saw a girl standing at the entrance to the path and a guy, she reckoned about 10 to 20 yards in the path. And it's just a tiny little lane. So she's, she clocks these two people driving around the sharp bend with two kids in the car and that was the story. She then gives this description that's nothing like Luke or Jodie, absolutely nothing like them. Um, and then the story changes and we end up with an identification. There are a couple of problems with this and I don't, I am not suggesting in any way that the witness herself was dishonest or um, trying to mislead. Her brother-in-law, we found out later, was in Jodie's grandmother's house the morning after Jodie was found. So Jodie was found around about midnight on June 30th. And on the morning of July 1st, this lady's brother-in-law was in the granny's house telling her about this sighting, telling the family about this sighting and giving them a description. He was then three days later in Jodie's family's house talking about this description and everything else. Um, he was there when this lady gave her first and second statements. So the idea, she was asked if she knew the, the Jones family and she said no. But they never followed up on the brother-in-law and the closeness of the relationship with the brother-in-law to the victim's family. So information was getting carried back and forward that can't not have influenced her recall. Um, similarly, on the when Luke's house was raided, he was taken in for the Section 14 interview on the 14th of August, so six weeks after the murder. They took a Polaroid picture of him that morning and took it up to this lady and said, is that him? And the following morning, pictures of Luke started appearing in the media. These were the first pictures of Luke in the media. Now, you can see how closely the two events would reinforce in her mind. But, but she said she never saw the guy's face. Why were they allowed to release photos? Without nothing to stop them. There was nothing to stop them for mm. age or... No, nope. because there was no conviction yet. There, there was there was no active proceedings. Um, age, it's not actually, or it wasn't unlawful to photograph under sixteens. Has that time. changed now? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's 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 more frowned upon. Because but, I read stories that people they can't show their identity because they're yeah. younger. Yeah. So. Yeah, and. There was DNA found at the body. Five, is there five pieces of DNA, am I correct? The, there were five unidentified profiles, mm -hmm. um, either on the clothing, around the body, or near the crime scene. Um, so we had Jodie's sister's boyfriend's DNA, a full DNA profile from her sister's boyfriend, found on the T-shirt that it was that Jodie was wearing. I'll come back to that. There was a condom found within sort of 20 yards of the body. Um, they, they never managed to trace the guy at the time who'd left the condom there. Various other deposits that, some of which are, are still un unidentified today. The, the sister's boyfriend's DNA, um, I'd never seen anything quite like this. They were waiting for the DNA results to come back to prove their main line of inquiry, which of course at the time was that Luke was the killer. And then the DNA came back with nothing of Luke at the, at the scene and nothing of Jodie 
Onluk or in his house or anywhere else. So they're kind of stuck here because the DNA's actually come back identifying another male that's not Luke. And essentially, they handed him an innocent explanation. They went back and they said, is it possible that Jodie borrowed this T-shirt from her sister and that would explain how her sister's boyfriend's DNA got on it? Now, you would think under normal circumstances that would be the most bizarre thing to do. Normally, somebody's DNA turns up mm -hmm. at the scene of a murder. They've got some explaining to do. Yeah, you're a suspect. Mm. But you're no. You're a suspect. No, they, they, they came up with this this borrowed T-shirt story to explain away the DNA on the T-shirt. So there was no DNA, Luke's DNA there? No. It was Luke with Jodie that day? He was with her in school um, up to lunchtime. Mm -hmm. Um but according to Jodie's mum, she got changed when she came in after school, mm -hmm. before she went back out again. Um, because there's obviously, the papers have written a lot of weird stuff about Luke, saying he had an appropriate relationship with his mum, they slept in the same bed, stuff like that. What, what was the, what's the story behind that? that? That was, again, these are the sort of things that were, were getting leaked either to the media or to the, the local community. So there was a story that, that the police had arrived and found Luke and Corrine um, sleeping in the same bedroom. Now, this was just after the Sky interview, which was a bit of a trick in itself. Sky had asked if they could interview Luke because he'd been asked to keep away from Jodie's funeral by Jodie's family. So Sky had asked if they could come and film the tribute that Luke and Corrine were having at home because he couldn't go to the, the funeral. Corrine has always, made, well, both Corrine and Luke have always maintained that they were promised that footage would not go out that day on the day of the funeral. And Sky put it out on the day of the funeral. So Corrine has an arm, a protective arm, round Luke's shoulder. While he's being asked questions by a TV reporter that a police officer would have had to ask under caution. And from this arm round the shoulder and this rumour about them sleeping in the same bedroom came the story that they, there was an inappropriate relationship between mother and son. Now, <clears throat> just to keep things real, at the same time, exactly the same time, that this story about finding them sleeping in the same bedroom broke, and in actual fact, they were sleeping in the living room on separate couches because Luke was heavily heavily medicated. He was heavily sedated after Jodie's murder. And his mum was frightened he would fall down the stairs, which is why they, they just stayed on the ground floor. But at the same time, Jodie's brother was sleeping in his mum's bedroom for very similar reasons. So, so you know, if nightmares are going to come calling, kids are desperately upset where are they going to go for comfort their mum they're only 14 as well so yeah but again the papers write that stuff and people are just going to think yes weird bastard crazy yeah. that's fucked up and automatically you're just going to think guilty yeah there was um people in a, boys in a moped around that area at that time as well that's that's again one of the most bizarre aspects of this case um on the friday so Friday night, so four days after Jodie's body was found, the police put out an appeal for two youths on a moped. Um, one of them, they came forward, one was spoken to on the Saturday, one on the Sunday, and they were eliminated by, from the inquiry by the Monday morning. One of these boys was Jodie's cousin, and the other was related slightly more distantly to, to Jodie's family. They, they had come through a local tool hire business and up the path on their moped. The moped was seen um, propped against the V-brake in the wall where Jodie was found behind the, the V-brake. Um, moped was there. They were nowhere to be seen at exactly the claim time of the murder, which was 5.15. One of them claimed that they hadn't come forward. They hadn't come forward to the police earlier because... Jodie's gran told them not to. I've never seen anything in all these years that says the police went back and said, this is what this guy's telling us. Is it true? Because if if they'd all said, no, absolutely not, we said nothing of the sort, he would have been in the frame, surely. Mm -hmm. 
They also lied about the time they were on the path. They said they were there, I think it was about an hour earlier, than they were actually there. So in advance, they'd lied to remove themselves from the path at what later would become the exact time of the murder. And and these guys weren't suspects. See if people have been lying, is that no contempt of court? Do they not get jail for that? Well, no, they didn't lie in court. Mm-hmm. They, they lied to the police when they first came forward. For a statement. Because they had to come forward because it had been all over the papers that they were looking for them. They lied then about the time. Now, the witnesses in the tool hire place, there were, I think it was, it was either five or seven witnesses in the tool hire place. They all told the police it was closing time. So around about five o'clock. These lads, when they came forward, gave a time 45 minutes to an hour earlier and walked out of the police station without that being checked. It was weeks before the police realised that they'd lied about the time and had to get them back in and speak to them again. But by then, the entire investigation was focused on Luke. How long was it after when Luke got a charge after the murder? How long later? Oh, um, a few months? No, it was... Nine and a half months later to mm-hmm. get a charge. Yep. Because I know Luke, the dog, was it a dog that found the body or was it Luke that found the body? The dog alerted. Um, so what happened? Jodie's mum texted Luke. It was a text for Jodie because Jodie's phone wasn't working right. Get yourself home now. That's you grounded for a fortnight. So Luke phoned her mum and said, I haven't seen her all night. She never turned up earlier on. Um, bit of to and fro in and Luke said right I'll come up for the new battle end up the path that she would have used and if I don't find her I'll come to the house and the adults can decide what happens next so he's left for the new battle end what he didn't know was that three members of Jodie's family had left from Mayfield which is where we are now so the opposite end making the way towards the path as well Um. They met Luke at the top of the path and then suggested a double check and they all went back down and the dog alerted just past this feed deck in the wall. Luke went over, shouted, I think there's something here. The sister's boyfriend went over and then the granny insisted on being helped over as well. So the three of them went over, found the body, all came back over the wall Luke had already dialed 999, then the police called them back, asking where they were. Um, but there was a real misunderstanding there because the police seemed to be of the opinion that Luke was the only person out searching. From that, they then drew the conclusion that Luke and Luke alone had found the body and that the three family members had arrived after Luke found the body, which... That's not what happened. And it's really difficult to understand how how they came to that conclusion in the first place. When when they were called out for the missing person report, you know, when Jodie was, was reported missing, um, they left her mum's house on the impression that Jodie had left with Luke at tea time from her own house, that Luke was the only one out searching and that Luke was coming up the path on his bike. Well, he was coming up the path with his dog. He wasn't the only one out searching, and he certainly did not leave Jodie's house with her at tea time. But you can understand why the police would be thinking, hang on, he left her at tea time, and now he's saying he hasn't seen her. Come on. And it doesn't look good that he has found the body either. Mm. Because if if nobody can, if everybody's searching, and the person who's a potential suspect finds the body, then... All the everything doesn't matter what kind of evidence you've got, it kind of leads to yeah. how does he know? And then the questions marks start arising. You, you could turn that round though, mm-hmm. because I said about the sister's boyfriend's um, DNA mm-hmm. on the t shirt. Luke had come up the path and checked it, and it was the family search trio, one of which was the sister's boyfriend, that suggested to go back down. So, equally, the, the same. It's one of the things about this case is that there are so many people that exactly the same arguments that are made to say it made Luke look bad could be used against other people. So what evidence What evidence was there then against Luke that got him a conviction? What was the evidence? Well, there's no DNA. 
the eyewitness testimonies have been absolutely trashed. Um, th- there were three planks. The His alibi, they said his brother couldn't support his alibi. His mum and his brother had covered up for him. The eyewitnesses had positively identified him. Um, and I've forgotten what the third one was now. What was his alibi? That he was at home cooking dinner. And his brother was there as well? No, his brother His brother was working. Um, Luke made the dinner for his mum and his brother because he was first in from school. Um, can he back that alibi up other than his mum and his brother? To an extent, yes, because phone calls were made from and received on the landline. And we can prove for certain where his mother was and it was not at home and we can prove for certain where his brother was and it was not at home. So somebody had to be in the house making calls and receiving calls on that landline. So he, somebody was, the, the both was at both were at work while he was making phone calls to them in the house? Yeah, his brother called him to say he was going to be late home mm-hmm. for his tea and Luke called his mum at work to say what did she want him to put on for dinner. Was the other brother ever a suspect? Not to my knowledge. What? How many suspects were there? One. Just the one? Even with other DNA there? And yes. There was four unidentified? Yeah. There was only ever one suspect. The the One of the other DNA profiles was identified three years later, um, 2006. Um, the guy the guy's DNA was run through the database for another another matter. And his story was that he went down the path that night. Uh, forgive me. He went down the path that night to masturbate because he didn't have any privacy because he shared his room with his brother so he went down gave an estimate of the distance he went down behind the wall did what he did discarded the condom came back up again and that was the end of it if that account was correct he reckoned it was between eight and nine o'clock at night and bear in mind the time of death was claimed to be five fifteen. if that was correct it was broad daylight till about half past ten that night he would have had to virtually step over the body on the way down and on the way back. But because it was three years later, there was nothing done about it because the case was closed because Luke Mitchell had been convicted. And what's quite terrifying is, <laughs> excuse me, this guy lived in a row of houses that look out onto the path. And the police... Search parameters, like like door-to-door parameters, stopped one door away from where this guy lived. But they were in his house for a completely different matter. Two of his brothers had found a hoodie, brought it to the attention of police, and they still didn't ask about other males in the house or where they'd been on it, nothing. It just... But for somebody to do the crime as well <clears throat> and not leave any DNA, they're obviously... They're, they're quite, they're quite clued up. So for somebody to not have any DNA doing a murder, but then have a fucking condom, it, do you know what I mean? To do that, it would kind of not make sense for me. Do you know what I mean? If they were to have no DNA on the body, or, and then we'll basically play with yourself and masturbate in a condom. Well, that's the thing. You see, we don't know mm-hmm. if any of the other... Um, was there any Jody's DNA rent on the condom or then nothing? They, they messed up the swabbing on the outer condom. So, outer bit, yeah. so, so they couldn't get results for that. Um, a number of the DNA profiles on the body and the clothing were only partial profiles, so they couldn't get mm-hmm. full matches to them. So it's at least a possibility that there is other DNA there that would match to other people. But because the police contaminate the crime scene terribly, really, really badly, a lot of the the potential DNA, if you like, was was contaminated. But in terms of DNA that could be attributed to Luke, because the number of markers that they did get... Um, None of these samples, they either had they either had DNA that was, was not in Luke's um, profile or they had DNA that was common to, I don't know, 50% of males. So could have been in anybody, any male's 
drove fire. So the lie detector in the in prison, how did that come about? Because look, I know he's sitting with his eyes closed doing the full because people think he's got his eyes closed, he's concentrating. If you do a murder and you believe it that long, you convince yourself that you've actually not done it. How did the lie detector become about and why did the prison let that happen? Why did Because there's footage on YouTube. Yes. But we're at, we'll put it at the end of this podcast of look, get, actually getting the lie detector. How did that become about? Because I've never seen that before. We'd we talked about it for a long time. Luke had always wanted to do a lie detector. So had Corrie. And they were just always told it's not, it's not admissible as evidence. And they didn't really want to do it for evidence. They knew it was never going to get in as evidence. They wanted to show Peace of mind. that they were telling the truth. So it took about a year going back and forward with, with the prison to get agreement that we could do it. Um, so the guy came up, a guy called Terry Mullins, came up from London and we were allowed into the prison and then we were taken through to basically just a goldfish bowl. Yeah. Glass sided. And when we got in there, Terry got all the stuff set up and there there were prison officers walking past outside. Everybody obviously was dead curious and you know, people pulling faces and, and just trying to put them off really. So it was Terry that said to him, just shut your eyes, just ignore them because I don't want you getting distracted by what's going on outside. Um, and that that's why that's why he closed his eyes. Um, and what was the questions that got asked? Luke was asked, did he know for certain where Jodie's body would be found or where Jodie's body was? Did he stab Jodie or, or harm Jodie in any way? And... Forgotten what the third question oh, sorry. was. And now. so the first one, did they know the body was? He says no. He said no. And that was correct. Absolutely. And yeah. did they stab her? And he says no. And that was correct. Yeah. And the other one was the other one was about harming her as well. What about for the questions for Kareen? Corinne was asked if she had ever disposed of any clothing or any other evidence belonging to Luke. She was asked if she'd lied to cover up for him. And again, I've forgotten what the third one it was. It was in the house at the time. Of, I think it was it was in the house. Yeah. At the time. Where was it at the time? That's, yeah. And uh, and she passed all three questions. Yes. Because it's brought a lot of misery. There's one family devastated who will die with that pain. And yes. we spoke about that earlier. They're, it's, um, they're, they're going to have to live with that. But again, for Corrine, she's... Um, She's had her caravans burnt down. Yes. She's um She's had a brick through the back windscreen of her car. She's um people have mentally and physically taught so that it's yes. she's been fighting for her son's freedom for sixteen years and it's it's only really yourself and her that's been trying to get yeah. shed some light on this and try to get a retrial because Luke's been trying to get a retrial for Well, so. I think that's the main thing here. If the authorities have got nothing to hide, if they're absolutely convinced Luke Mitchell's Jodie's murderer, let's just see all the evidence. Like, with Hillsborough, they had an independent panel who were allowed to go in and just look at everything and review it. Let's see that. If the evidence is there... So why are they not? Why is there not been a retrial? Why they keep? Why have they kept knocking it back to retry the case and... Do you think they've made a mistake or do you think that because if they know if that comes out that he's innocent, that's just going to cause more a shitstorm for I think that's the, the case. police, the everybody and again, I'm not a professional. I'm just here to sit, shed some light on it. There's a possibility he could be innocent. There's a possibility when two people pass a lie detector. But again, I'm not a professional in this field. I'm just here to shed light on it. But when you're looking when you you actually look into it to see there was no DNA, there was uh, passing two lie detectors and he's always protested his innocence. He hasn't um, locked himself away and put himself in protection. He's, no. he's took it in the chin and he's got some amount of abuse in prison. And if people think that's a crime, then then you would act like that if yeah. if you think someone's murdered a 14-year-old kid. Yeah. Because that crime alone, I've got kids, you've got kids, and it's... Yeah. 
And I, it, that's one of the it's things difficult. I've, I've been saying for 16 years, you know. I don't do any of this to... I know there's, there's no avoiding causing more pain for Jodie's family by bringing this up. I know that. Mm -hmm. But that's not why I do it. I'm, I, I'm always very, very mindful as a mum of girls. Yeah. How have you been treated? Because it's a small area. It's a small area. Everybody talks. How have you been treated by working on this case and try to bring bring it to light and trying to get Luke Mitchell free? How have you been treated? Initially, it was not great. Um, I've been spat on. I've been pushed off the pavement in front of cars. I've had death threats. Um, the police themselves would stop me in the car at every opportunity they got. Um, I never used public transport round about here. I'd have to check the headlines to see if it was safe to go into the local shop. That that was the extent of the feeling up here. And I totally understand it. I understand they think, or back then they thought I, I was supporting a monster, but m my question has always been, why would they think I would do that? I had two teenage girls in this area. If there was the tiniest doubt in my mind that it was Luke Mitchell who did to Jodie what was done to her. Why on earth would I be saying, we need this guy back in our community? We, he needs to be set free. That would be insanity. When was the last time you spoke to Luke? Um, about, what, 2014. And how is, is he still trying to get a new date, a new retrial? Because I believe he said he's not going to leave prison unless he's a free man. It, he, he will protest his innocence to the end. He will never say he did it just to get out or just to get better uh, treatment. Never. Have they offered him that that yet to admit no. the crime to let him no, go? He, they push every year for it, don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, every review. You, you're not, you've not addressed your offending behaviour because I've got no offending behaviour to address. And round it goes. Was that, did you think there was any other suspects that could potentially have done the crime? Yeah. How many? How many names? I well, no names, but yeah. how many people are, are allegedly that um, you could think? There were certainly three. Three other suspects. Three that I would have said, had I been a, a police officer, which I'm not, um, looking at the case, and I said we need to look at him. We definitely need to look at him, and we better get him in and see where he was and what he was doing and, you know, where he's been since. That that would have been those three in particular. Do you ever question yourself and think, what if you're wrong? Absolutely. And think, why the fuck Absolutely. am I going through this every day? Why am I putting myself through this torment? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I don't think you can do this work if you don't ask that question every day. What if I'm wrong? What, what if I've missed something? You know, what if... I don't know, what if what if there's something that they know about that we don't? That's why I'm saying, if we go for a review and everything's on the table, then everybody knows for sure, me included. Because it, it's... I've gone through everything that's been available to the defence. I've also spoken to people who were never spoken to by the defence, by the prosecution back at the time or people who were bullied and harassed at the time who are adults now who've contacted me and said listen I want to tell you this is how we were treated to get us to say what they wanted us to say so in terms of the overview of the evidence and the circumstances and everything else yeah for what we've been allowed access to I would say there's there's no doubt that Luke did not do this but there's always going to be at the back of your mind, what if they've got this? They would have yeah. used it, clearly. There's always there's always going to be a seed of doubt. Yeah. Anything you do in life, there's yeah. always going to be a seed of doubt. But you received uh, files with information on it? I got all the case files. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really when the whole thing, for me, started to come down like a house of cards. There was so much in there. Um, the stocky man, now, this guy was seen following Jodie um, the night she went, the night she was murdered, around about five o'clock. 
and there were two independent witnesses to Stocky Man. He was never traced, apparently, and he was kind of just dropped quietly from the investigation um, because obviously he couldn't have been Luke. So, yeah, they just didn't go after him. 2014, 11 years after the murder, we find out he was identified at the time. Was that he was questioned? No. No. After the identification, it was just filed. So why would why would they not follow follow up the, the this evidence in these suspect? Was it a case of they thought it was Luke, they had enough evidence to, to to say that there was eyewitnesses there and there was witnesses to say that they'd seen him at that time that they didn't even think about anybody else? Or is it a case of is there somebody covering something up? Is a a miscarriage of justice where they never found a charge, never got a charge for nearly a year. They had to get somebody. There's a lot of pressure on them. Personally, in your opinion, what do you think? What's the, what do you think the whole outcome is in this? I think the, well, to put it bluntly, they screwed up from the off. Mm -hmm. Literally from the minute Jodie was, was um, reported missing. It was one blunder after another, after another. They contaminated the crime scene. They let the other three... How did they contaminate the crime scene? Well, they just climbed over the wall and traipsed around it and gathered up clothes. And Would that not, though, if Luke had evidence, that could have maybe trampled his evidence as well? It could have done, but it would have been interesting that it managed to like lose Luke's evidence but leave other people's there. Mm -hmm. um, they, they gathered up Jodie's clothes before the forensics people got there. They rolled the body onto a plastic sheet before the forensics people got there. They cut down overhanging branches so that the videographer could get a better look before forensics got there. That That's just from the beginning. They were all climbing over the wall at the V-point, which you'd have thought would have been... Closed off. ...of, of significance. Um, they let the, the remainder of this, the, the other three members of the search party go and mingle with other members of the family. They took their phones with them. They didn't get their phones. They didn't take statements from them. They didn't get their clothes for, for forensic testing. It was it was just a shambles from the off. And I think the problem there was, once they realised what a shambles it was, they also realised there was no going back and undoing that. You know, how, how could they fix the mess they'd made in the first six hours or so? What's the story about the, the Parker jacket? Oh, um, the, the, it's a kind of weird one. The claim was that Corrine burned a Parker jacket that Luke had been wearing when he committed the murder in a log burner in her back garden. So presumably to, to destroy evidence. Corrine's and Luke's take on it is that Luke didn't have a Parker jacket prior to the murder, the police took all of his clothes on the 4th of July. Everything, apart from what he was standing in on the 4th of July in the first raid. So Corrine took him clothes shopping on the Wednesday because they had nothing to wear. And the parka jacket was bought that day and she handed the receipt to the police because they asked for it. Um, so so this, this whole thing about... It, it, they were looking for a, a missing parka jacket, but Corrine had bought the, the parka jacket as a replacement for the missing parka jacket. Which again, why would you? If you knew your son had murdered somebody in a parka jacket, would you stick him back in a parka jacket? Anyway, um, they came and they took all the ash from the log burner in the back garden, which was a wee thing that size. Um, took all the ash from it, forensically tested all the, all the bricks and everything, nothing. No evidence of any clothing burnt there. No opportunity for her to dispose of ash because the um, family liaison officer was there from day one. So there was no chance to get rid of the ash had she burned clothing there. Um, and then all this, all this nonsense about people seeing Luke or being claimed to have seen Luke in a parka jacket used as, as witness statements... Yeah, that photograph that I was talking about the day after he was taken in on the, the 14th of August, so six weeks after the murder. The first photograph to appear in the papers was of Luke in a parka jacket. And there were dozens of them after that, always in the parka jacket. So if you ask anybody in this area, 
Have you ever seen Luke Mitchell in a parka jacket? Yeah, most of Scotland had. The question would be, what reason would you have to remember? If you knew him, I mean, obviously we didn't know, so it would have to be afterwards. But if you knew him, what reason would you have had to remember if he had a parka jacket prior to that? And the giveaway on that is they got a witness who did know Luke, um, brought him in to give evidence against Luke, and he said he saw him in a local shop wearing said parka jacket. And he was asked, what made him notice it was a parka jacket? And the guy said, oh, well, it was the murder and everything. Yes, yeah, so it must have been after the murder then. That's, that's, that's the level of what they were calling evidence they so were relying on. Was there many witnesses against Luke? Or oh, not in the whole case, was there many witnesses went up to speak against him? Was there any, how many witnesses do you have on his side? None. No, I've never had any witnesses? No. No, his mum, his brother? Well, his mum and his brother were um, charged with perverting the course of justice and those charges were only dropped when they were on the stand. So they wouldn't allow... Um, the, there were a number of witnesses that the defence wanted to call and they they were disallowed for one reason or another. Um, I, I can't remember what the expert... Oh, the expert on recall... Um, Speaking in particular about the the lady who who very clearly would have been being influenced with stories going back and forward with such cl close proximity to the fact they wouldn't allow him to give evidence um, because he hadn't um, examined the lady in question. So the fact that that we know psychologists know that that the impact on recall of of additional information that wasn't enough so that was disallowed so see the first nine months before he got his sentence he got charged were you around then or was it after when he went to prison no I, I was involved from September 2003 so 10 weeks after the murder and that's when you got involved how yeah. was Luke's mindset then after the murder till court absolutely convinced they would realise they were going after the wrong guy, get their act together and actually go and find the person that did this. Was absolutely a, convinced. Was he a, a cooperating with the police and yes. statements <clears throat> and yep. giving everything he can to, yep. to keep, obviously giving his statements and give them information what they can? Yep. The whole family were. The whole family were. The liaison officer was in the house from... The 1st of July to the 13th of August, because the, the, the second raid was 14th. Um, and there's a bit of the interview on the 14th where Luke and his mum are saying to, to the, the police officer, why didn't Michelle tell us this was going to happen? We thought that's what she was there to do. We thought she was there to keep us up to date with, with developments. So... Right up to that point, they're trusting this liaison officer is there to guide them and help them when in actual fact all she was doing was trying to gather. Again, I, I'm reluctant to call it evidence. She was looking for pieces of information that could be twisted to make the family look... Crazy. Weird or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did Luke go back to school or anything? Oh, no, he was banned from... He did actually go back for one day... Initially, he was banned from returning to school. And, of course, we did the, the big media fanfare about it being for um, safety, initially for the safety of the pupils, and then realising what they'd done because he hadn't been charged with anything. Oh, uh, for everybody's safety, uh, sp speaking to everybody about appropriate behaviour, all this nonsense. Um, they let him go back. Um, and Corinne got a call from Luke to say... He was being kept isolated in a classroom by himself, wasn't being taught with the other kids, wasn't being allowed to mix with the other kids, was basically just being kept in a room on his own. So she went, took him out of school. There was clearly words. Um, and after that, he was tutored privately because he couldn't, they wouldn't have him back in school. It's, it is a weird, it's, it's, it's it is a weird situation because it's the it's the lie detectors thing it kind of gets me and the lack of 
No DNA. Mm-hmm. Was there ever a murder weapon found? No. No. What do you? So, what's the plan? What's the outcome for you now to to get this case? Are you going to keep working on this case until do you try and get look a retrial? Do you get them free? Is there a time you feel like giving up? Many, many have been the times that I've felt like giving up. Um, the reason I put the book out is if I were forced to give up. So if anything happened to me, I don't think there's anybody else in Scotland got the, the level of knowledge of the case that I've got. And the idea was put everything I know in there and then if anybody else wants to come along and take over... And take the reins. The information's there because my dad died suddenly at 56 and I'm 55. So it's one of these things that you have mm. to think about, you know, You're if I go wary. and take this mm-hmm. with me. You want to get all... Because... I know when you got the case files, there was a lot of stuff that never get put forward. There was a lot of witnesses that never get spoken to. What what else were in the, the, the case files that you think were didn't sit right? Why was that not used in court? Why was this covered oh, up? Oh, there was there was so much stuff. Um, well, for example, the the boys in the moped saying that the granny told them not to go to the police. Um, the thing about the the eyewitness and and the brother-in-law, um, the change the change in the family stories, Jodie's family stories. So so the three members of the search trio on the path all said for a month in all their statements for a full month that the dog reacted at the wall, and Luke doubled back and went through the, the V break. Um, the sister's boyfriend said, um, as an example. It's a big dog. It's an Alsatian. Um, when it was standing up against the V, its its head was higher than the bottom of the V. So that that's quite a quite a vivid description. By the time they got to trial, the, the, the statement started to change after the first month. And by the time they got to trial, the dog didn't react at all. Luke just was walking down the path and popped himself over the wall. So so then we get the case paper and there's all these statements where the family are saying. No, you know, the the dog started going nuts and Luke went over and then, and like they said that he didn't react, he showed no emotion. And yet in the statements, um, Jodie's sister saying, I could tell by the panic in his voice that it was something bad. You know, he, he, his eyes were wider than normal, Luke, like he was in total shock. It's all in there. So could you, in a retrial, could those old statements get used? Um, or is it a touchy subject? It's difficult because I, I didn't know when I started this the the, the um, concept of statements being adopted. So unless you agree when you're giving your evidence that what's in the statement's correct, the statement can be allowed. Because you can evidence. change your statement mm-hmm. at this time. Maybe you're in shock. Or you didn't know what to say. People yeah. do change their statements all the time. When can it not be changed? A statement. I don't think there's ever a time that a statement can be changed. So, so the, the difficulty is if if you've said something in a statement and it's put to you on the stand, did you say this? Mm-hmm. And you say, oh, that's not what I meant, and you refuse to accept it. It can't. It but can't you can. So the as... first statement you can use in court. Yes. So they uh, those those statements that you're talking about when they were interviewing the witnesses, they were never used. The first statements. No. No, the defence did try to did try to bring them up and say, but you said for the first month, you mm-hmm. were telling the same story as he is. Um, Do you think they were just wanting then a conviction? Uh, obviously, Jodie Jones's family will want a conviction, but then the police, do you think that people were getting, they started in their own mind that Luke was, because the police were after him from the get-go. Yes. His, his name was, it was fired about from as soon as from it happened, one. yes. Yeah. So... Again, people looking at that case are going to think automatically he's guilty. Yes. So how do we? How do you go further from this now? How do you? What's the plans for you now in Luke's case? Because if it was to get a retrial, you're talking maybe another three, four years, and has he got a release date yet? Has he got? No, he got a minimum. Um, twenty years. Twenty, but he won't be eligible for parole because he won't address offending behaviour. He won't participate in any of the, the you know um, training courses or anything because he didn't do it 
Um, and from my experience of other cases, that being the case, he won't progress. So so the 20 year date will come and go and he'll still be in. However many years after that will come and go because as well. Because you go and get like, anger management and get your, where he's a high risk to yeah. and work on yourself and... But if he's adamant that it wasn't him, then he could have been there for a long time until this yeah. eventually gets a retrial. How can people buy your book? How can people get a hold of your book? Um, it's on Amazon. It's Innocence Betrayed, Innocence mm -hmm. Betrayed. Um, and, and it's available on Amazon. And it really does. I think the, the discovery that what's allowed to pass as justice and what's allowed to pass as evidence and what's allowed to pass as, you know, fairness in our courts is is so poor. I'd never have believed it. I would never have believed that they can get away with the sort of things they get away with until I saw it with my own eyes. And that I, I'm not asking anybody to take my word for it. I'm not. Just have an open mind. The information's there. Go have a look. See, see how you feel about what you've been told by the media for all these years compared to what they actually knew. Not not necessarily the media, but what the authorities actually knew, the information they actually had. Because, yeah, it's one of these things that kind of makes me laugh. People go, ah, oh, you're only telling one side of the story. Yeah. And what do you think mainstream media has been doing for the last 16 years? I always believe there's three sides to a story, and I say that earlier. Yeah. There's always both sides, and then there's the truth. So... It's to, for me personally, it's to have an open opinion of every situation. Yeah. The reason why is because, again, Joe Steele, 18 years he done. Mm -hmm. he done 18 years, the man, and he was innocent. Yeah. And everybody, at the, not his family and stuff, but if you read that in the papers, then what you read in the papers, Monsters, Ice Cream Wars, then you then it's just, you're in your mind that he's, that he's guilty. So yeah. it's to keep an open mind and think, wait a minute, there's a possibility Everybody, in, let's face it, everybody in prison says they're, they're guilty, uh, they're innocent. But Joe says in my podcast as well, if you're really innocent, you don't give up. Yeah. Some people get their sentences like three, four years down the line, they've kind of adapted, they've accepted and they don't want to fight no more. If you're innocent, you don't want to stop. And Luke's one of those boys who don't want to stop and he wants to keep fighting for his innocence. Yeah. Again, I don't know the full just of the case, but to shed some light on it and maybe have an open people have an open opinion maybe change their opinion and other people can look into it and maybe get a retrial but again it's going to dig up a lot of because there's never going to be closure for no. the uh, the Jones family and I understand and for me to do this is I'm going to get a lot of backlash yeah. but for me to be honest with myself and if somebody's as a possibility somebody's innocent fuck it I'm, I'm a man I'm not a coward I'm not going to shy away I'm going to yeah. bring it to light and and maybe that, that there is a miscarriage of justice there mm -hmm. and there is a lack of evidence. Maybe people's pampered with evidence. Maybe they try. I, I just don't, for me, it's just to bring it to the surface. And yeah, and that, a, that's, you know, that's, that really is for nearly 16 years. That's, that's all I've been asking is instead of going with this screeching media coverage, have a look, have a look at what else is there. And ask yourself, why did I never know that? Why have I never heard that in 16 years? Because if I was making it up, I'm sure it would have been sued by now. Has none, nobody ever done that, want to do an interview with you, Sandra? Or to tell your story and get it out there? Like mainstream media, Daily Record, Sun? Um, the Evening News, way back in 2007, did an interview. Um, that was when I'd written the first book. Um, there have been there have been approaches and they've all dropped out at the last minute and I don't know if that's just because they don't want this case getting dug up again. They don't. They, they, there's too much there's too much behind the scenes that they don't want coming out now and it's easier just to ignore it. It's easier just to make it go away than to risk having somebody like me saying... Go have a look. Yeah, but if you keep chatting the door loud enough, then eventually it will open. So, Sandra, for coming on, is there anything you want to finish by? Is there anything you, want you say before we, we, we finish up here that maybe people can look into? A... No, I think, just like you said, have an open mind. Go back. Look at look at what you were fed over all those years 
and go back and ask yourself, you know, what if that was me? What if they were saying all that stuff about me or about my son or about my brother or whatever? What would you do? How would you stop them? How do you deal with that? Because the truth is, it could happen to anybody. Of course it could. What was it? Sorry, before we finish up, what was the one? Was Luke told, told not to cry or when he got convicted? He was told what to was show that? no emotion. Who says that? Whatsoever. Uh, his legal team. Why? I think there's the judges see ahead of um, verdicts and, and big cases like that. No unseemly behaviour, you know. Everybody's to be quiet. Yeah. Um, but he said himself for years, he was damned if he did, damned if he didn't. If he cried, it would be in crocodile tears. Yeah, so people are going to judge. People already had their opinion, including myself. Yeah. I had my opinion, and I was only a young boy, but I do remember the headlines and stuff, and that does stick, and I still remember it to this day. And then, But again, it's to have an open mind that there is always possibilities that people are innocent, but there's also possibilities that they could also be guilty. So yeah. for coming on today, Sandra, and telling your story, I really appreciate it, and I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button so you are notified for when my next video goes on my channel. You can also catch me on Twitter at JamesEnglish0 or Instagram at JamesEnglish2 or Facebook at JamesEnglish11. You can also download these podcasts on Podbean or iTunes. I just want to say thank you to my sponsors, Fire Suppression Scotland and Select Blinds for also sponsoring this episode. For all your fire safety requirements, fire alarms, fire extinguishers, fire risk assessment, fire doors, and also CCTV, fire suppression have your safety as their main priority. For inquiries, you can contact them on 01698 200562 or email on info at firesuppressionscotland.org. At Select Blinds, if you want to find something unique, then Select Blinds is a place for you. They take pride in their ability to manufacture blinds to order, using a range of materials and fabrics. They can take your needs, specifications and instructions to use them to create blinds of any colour or style. If you're looking for something that you've seen in a catalogue, then they keep a range of popular blinds in stock, each of which can be modified and sized to fit your windows perfectly. Whatever they're looking for, an individual item or something that's off the shelf, Select Blinds will give you that ideal choice. When you make a purchase at Select Blinds, the delivery and fitting is also free of charge. So for inquiries for Select Blinds, give them a call on 01236 443 636 or drop them a message on Facebook page Select Blinds and Shutters. AM Events are specialists in party wedding and event planning management. They offer services from full event planning and management right down to the standalone venue dressing. AM events strive for 100% customer satisfaction every time from email updates and how about the planning is going, managing the day of the event. They will support you the whole way through. So for more information, to make a booking, pop down to their showroom at Unit 2, Foundry Street, Atlas Industrial Estate in Glasgow. Their phone number is 0141 237 3020. So pop along or else their social media pages are on Facebook AM Events and also Instagram at amevents.glasgow.